As a general contractor, you depend on your sub. The better your subs are, easier it makes your life as a general contractor. As a subcontractor, you don't mass manage, you detail manage. We're talking about interest rates, right? Interest rates are going up. We see lumber pricing starting to come down. Quality and productivity for me is more a function of your foreman and your superintendents pre-planning and removing obstacles. Maybe what we need is more planning. And the more complex jobs you have, the more that's required. This is Maestro Minute, the show that discusses all things real estate, sharing interviews with the most successful people in the industry. Hear from their perspective and what they are doing to achieve success. Get exclusive tips on how you can also succeed in real estate. Maestro Minute is brought to you by Maestro Development. Here's your host, Nareg Muradian. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Maestro Minute. I'm your host, Nareg Muradian, and I'm super excited today. We're gonna talk a little bit about what it's like to be a subcontractor and a, a general contractor and the difference. I'm really excited to have our guest today, Armando Rodarte. Armando, thanks for joining, man. Thank you, thank you. Good to see you. Likewise, good to see you too. So Armando brings a wealth of experience, not only from the general contracting world, but the subcontracting world. So today, kind of want to do a deep dive, talk to Armando a little bit about what that's about, what his experiences are through that, kind of where we could do better in the world as a GC and a subcontractor, and then how and what's the future of uh, the subcontracting business. Obviously, there's AI coming in and everything. So having said that, just a quick intro on you, Armando. You started at Cal Poly. Uh, we both are Cal Poly guys. I met you when we were both working for a GC, a general contractor, and then we kind of both went our separate ways. Give the viewers a little background of your kind of your roadmap to where you've gotten to where you're at. Right now, you're a CEO of multiple subcontracting companies. You're running a lot of work in uh, California. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, so yeah, um, I'll go back a little bit into my, my college, and we both, uh, Graduated from construction management in uh, from Cal Poly Pomona. I started my internship on the general contracting side where I actually had the honor and pleasure of meeting you as one of my early mentors. Right. I forgot uh, I was your mentor. Yeah, one of my early mentors. Yeah. I must have done well because look at you, you. You know what? You did well. You did well. So I learned a lot and it was a short period of time that I worked in the general contracting world. But I, I think I understood the concepts early and I think that I gravitated towards you early because of that spirit of always questioning things, never accepting, never accepting an answer of, you know, it is what it is and just do it because I said so. And I think that that really helped push to question how to make things better. So in 2010, I had an opportunity to start a, frame, a framing company, subcontracting business. And in 2010, I started in a garage, just three of us and, uh, fast forward into today, it's uh, three separate companies. Uh, we just hit 200 employees for the first time. Uh, and I really think that we're just starting to take off and uh, applying a lot of the bumps and bruises from the early phases to, to today. So what, what set you your mindset to go from the GC side to the sub side? Like, what was that transition like? Why did you go to that route? Some people stay, they go to another GC firm. Um, you know, like, what was your mindset? So for me, uh, my, my father grew up in the trade, and I always talked as a, as a young kid with my, my father that someday we would do our own thing. And that someday him and I could, could make a decision and set forth what did we want that to look like from a different perspective. Uh, in many cases, people who are making decisions for the people that work for the business, a lot of times can't relate and don't know what is really actually what's actually happening down at their level so we decided that we wanted to start our own and do it do it in a manner in a fashion that represented their point of view and in theory it was a great idea but there was a lot of learning that we were still pretty unaware of that we learned learned throughout these last 14 years what would you say is the difference <laughs> between being a general contractor and being a subcontractor you know that was one of the things that I probably struggled with with the most uh, coming from the general contracting side. In the very beginning, the level of general contracting typically is higher, and there was a concept that I learned where, as a general contractor, you depend on your subs. The better your subs are, the easier it makes your life as a general contractor. And so when I made the switch from general contracting to subcontracting, as a subcontractor, you don't mass manage. 
you detail manage. Therefore, the biggest difference that I saw when I came on the, on the subcontracting side is you're, de you're managing, but you're at the detailed level. So how does this intricate piece go together? Rather than the general contracting side, you're managing that the whole piece comes together. So I would say just a level of attention to detail um, was the biggest difference on my side that it took a little while to get used yeah. to. Yeah, I know a lot of our projects, actually all of them, the subs run the job. If the sub is doing well, they know the project, they're on schedule, they have the right productivity, the job goes well, but if there's something off, then it kind of puts a rock in the, the shoe, as you say, and slows things down. So I think that's pretty cool. So what could GCs and subs do together to kind of work better together? I see there's always kind of some kind of conflict. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's an approach of meeting more in the middle. Um, I don't think it's something that just general contractors need to do, and I don't think it's something that just subcontractors need to do. I think there's a piece of it that there has to be a meet in the middle. I believe that a lot of times subcontractors show up not having any information, not having prepared and given their field enough information or enough <laughs> tools, and I'm not talking about, you know, your saws and et cetera, but whether it's technology, whether it's access to information, and that already creates frustration on the front end. From the general contracting side, there's always this notion that a sub is out to get you and it's vice versa. So that creates a toxic relationship from the beginning. Our best clients today are ones that know and value the type of uh, service that we're gonna provide and that we always ask that we just be treated fairly. And so if you're being treated fairly, if you're being treated with respect and you're giving that in exchange, you're going to meet in the middle because you know that you have each other's back, that it is a mutual relationship. When we go into a contract, it isn't, oh, I finally, I can get one over on you. It's how is this a mutual relationship between both of us? Because if it goes well for us, it goes well for, for vice versa. So I think there's a lot of room still for improvement there. Some projects lend it to itself better, but it's, a, it's an early mindset that is already ingrained in general contracting and some contractor relationships that the more that can change, the better. Yeah, that makes sense. How do you bid jobs? Like obviously you've grown the business, so you're getting a lot more opportunities to bid jobs, but like obviously you have your profit margin, but like as a sub and you're bidding work, when you're competing with these other subs, what is it that you see as, as like how you bid work? You know, like what's, what's, what is that like? So I would say, and I might need some clarification on your question, but like me... as a GC, as you bid work, you have all the different trades and disciplines and you may get numbers, you may not get numbers, you put in allowances, but like if you're bidding, if you're bidding on a project, obviously the, the quantity of the, whatever the material is, is set, right? You know, your profit margin, right? But like you're putting in productivity into that. Like, how do you, how do you gauge all that so that you feel comfortable giving a number to a contractor. So one of the first things is um, the majority of the time, we do not what's called square foot bid. We don't take a situation and go, oh, this is only, this is similar to another circumstance or situation and let's bid a project with that in mind. We look at each project and give it its full attention and detail. We look at it for what are, what's access like, what does, uh, is it a remodel project? A remodel project, you're not going to be able to access it from the same manner. Is this project, do our guys need to park a mile away from the street or a mile away from the project? Is this project, if it's out of our territory, do we have to lodge this project? And so if we ever don't look at all of those circumstances, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot. And so each project is handed to one of our estimators. Uh, we have four estimators on the framing side, two on a structural steel side. They're given the tool. So we use uh, Plant Swift. So using digital technology for all of our quantity takeoffs, review, high detail. That goes into a chief estimator that reviews the work of our estimator and takes into account certain variables. When is a project awarded? If the project is awarded and it needs to be immediately and we're already stretched thin, well, we might not be able to do that for a lower margin. It might not be something we want to take on. And we want to make sure that if we are bidding a job, that we, we ensure that we're going to be successful with it. I think one of the worst things you can do is bid, bidding work and then not being able to actually deliver upon it. Do you see a lot of your competition doing that? You know, I, 
I don't I don't want to speak bad about my competition because I would say that in my competition, good, right, or indifferent is after the same thing. And that's just to run a good business, be able to provide for their teams, for their families. And so I wouldn't say that they do it, they don't do it wrong, but they do it differently. Would I do it the same as they do? Not necessarily. I think some of our competition, and I'm sure there's some on the larger side that do it even better and different than us. But some of the ones where I see that I don't agree with yeah. are bidding to a, what's called a square foot. So they take a project and go, oh, and it's, it's around this amount without looking at all the variables that can be related to it. And we'll see it because we know we have extensive history of our, of our project cost. We do a detailed estimate and let's say that we have a million dollar project for a bid and our comp competition's at 750. Yeah. We know that that is inaccurate. D is it a million? Not necessarily, but it's not 750. And so what we do is we recognize which of those general contractors entertain bids of that quality and still believe that they're qualified bids. And that just means that we, that's not for us. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I see all the time that we'll get multiple bids on different types of projects and trades and the numbers could be close, which is a positive thing. But oftentimes you get a super low number and then a super high number and then two numbers in the middle that are pretty close, right? And once you qualify them, you're basically vetting out, did they take a square foot number or did they actually take into account the things you mentioned? And I think Part of the issue has been in the recent past, we've had capacity issues, we've had a pandemic, we had inflation, we've had material shortages, you know? So like you have all these variables out there and depending on the capacity of the sub or the GC, what are they, what value are they putting out? So we, we like to vet that out and I, I'm glad you brought that up. What, what have you seen and what's the current market like right now now that we've been through inflation and the pandemic and supply and chain issues, have, have things, have you seen it stabilize or where, where are we at? Where, do you, where are you guys at? Where do you see? So what we've seen is uh, the lumber market is still, it's declining, but it's still somewhat volatile. And so we've seen, we track lumber on a weekly basis. Uh, we have a meeting about it every Tuesday morning. And we're talking about what is the current economic standing? What is the sentiment as, as America? Are we, are we in a recession? Are we heading that way? Are things booming? We're talking about interest rates, right? Interest rates are going up. We see lumber pricing starting to come down. And so we're looking at those types of things. We're talking about it. And not that we're forecasting what's going to happen. Yeah. We just want to be up to date with what is currently happening. And so you're saying, so I know lumber prices skyrocketed, right? Mm -hmm. In the past couple of years, even though they're coming down now a little bit, it's still high year over year. It's still that pretty is high, correct. right? Uh, and if inflation, if rates go up, that means that prices are going down only because there's less uh, activity in the I would market? say less activity. Yeah. So yeah. there's less activity in the market. And, and so people are a little more hesitant to, to, to bulk buy. Therefore, prices are starting to come down. And then let's say the new year starts, construction picks up again, and we see a spike again. So just being, being aware, I would say that it isn't nearly as skyrocketing as a time of uh, that COVID period of time. Yeah. Uh, and I would say differently than for, for like labor. Labor, uh, we haven't seen a shortage in Southern California of work, therefore manpower is difficult. Is there a shortage of labor? Is it hard to find good labor? That's a, a, a battle, a battle of always hearing uh, the word or the term good labor, right? Skilled labor. When I opened the business in 2010, when I talked to my foreman at the time, there's no more good skilled labor. Uh, guys, no one wants to work, there's no skilled labor. and. In reality, that's not true. We've been, there's construction going all around us. Since 2010, we've completed every single one of our projects. We've never had a shortage of not, or not being able to complete a project. So can we just pick up labor on a, uh, without a plan, without forecasting how much labor we're gonna need? We're gonna struggle. That's, it's not gonna be easy, but you can find labor. You just have to have a plan for it. But the qual you gotta you gotta look out for quality and productivity, right? And so quality and productivity for me is more a function of your foreman and your superintendents pre-planning and removing obstacles. 
You can have great skilled labor with no plan and it won't matter. They're not gonna magically just produce and move all these obstacles out of the way. And so maybe what we need is more planning. And the more complex jobs you have, the more that's required. So just to show up and think that you're gonna get there and you'll figure it out as you're there, yeah, your margins aren't there for that. Maybe, maybe they were then, or since I've been in business, that hasn't been available. But you do, do subcontractors price things out based on a certain like productivity pace and level? Yeah, absolutely. So we will take whether we look at, hey, we know that uh, framing, for example, is a unit cost based on an, on our data, or we'll look at it in terms of man hours. And so we are looking at, at scope and saying, all right, how many man hours would this take? And we have our costing for our man hours. And so, yeah, that's... That's, that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked a little bit about growing your business, talked about the difference between subs and GCs. Where do you see the construction market going? What's the future of subcontractors and construction from, what, from where you're at? I think the future construction has to include more prefabricated. I think that is one of the items that has been around and I think is only going to increase. So prefabricated in a shop and then brought out to the project site. That'd be one of the the, the bigger things. Yeah, I'd say prefabricating is going to be one of the one of the keys in augmented reality, virtual reality. Do I think those are going to be a player in construction? I think so. Are we forecasting how we're going to use it? Not necessarily, because I think it's further out. And so, what I've talked to my team about is using continuous improvement as a value that we use as a business. And so in using continuous improvement is we don't have to think about how we're going to use virtual reality or augmented reality or, or even AI tomorrow. We just need to be open to the idea that it's coming. It's here and it's coming. And so if we have an open mindset to question, well, how can we do something different? As these tools are being more introduced and more mainstream, we're going to be open to trying them rather than believing that there that there's no space for them because there's certainly a space for them yeah. and it's coming. What about we talked about labor shortages? I saw a video of a robot doing like uh, drywall uh, framing. Where do you see that? Where do you see robots coming in and, and actual labor re uh, replacement or subsidizing labor? Do I believe it's going to happen? A version of it. And so robotics is already being used in certain call it repetitive task. And I think that drywall is, is a repetitive task. Uh, I've seen a machine that can uh, tie rebar as one of the, it, it's a redundant task that can be over and over and over. And that will certainly be available. That I think it will replace a lot of construction? No, I don't. I just, there's too many tasks, but will it be assisted by robotics and still have someone that has the skill and knowledge and that can operate and be a piece of it? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'm excited to see how that plays out because it's going to be, it's not going to replace labor, I don't think. I think it'll subsidize labor and potentially get costs down, right? I was super excited about that. Last question, you've been super successful in what you've done, the roadmap you've created. I think it's great. I, I'm, I'm super excited for people out there to hear your story. What do you think has driven you to get to where you're at today? I would say, honestly, it's, it's tenacity. And it really came back to even the mindset that I met you at a young age is, I've never allowed anyone to say, this is, a, this is all you can do, right? Your position is this, you, you can do task one, two, and three. I don't believe in that. What's stopping me from learning? Why am I not allowed to learn more? And so having that mindset of not, not allowing to be put in a box, like I understand following rules, following orders, and absolutely, but not being able to learn is that somehow became this rule that you're not allowed to because you're not given permission. So I've never asked for permission to learn more. And I've applied that same concept, which just comes back down to tenacity to everything I've done. I've never, I've never stopped myself because I didn't know something before. Isn't that, aren't we all born not knowing? Right. And so I don't know something and that's okay, but I'm not afraid to ask someone to teach me. I'm not afraid to look for it myself and I'm not afraid to try it. What's the worst gonna do? I'm gonna fail? What's so wrong in that? So I think that's great because you started advanced framing and did really well. What led you to start your steel company. Hmm. What was the name of the steel company? Premier Steel. Premier Steel. So we have advanced framing structures and Premier Steel structures. 
And so um, what led me to Premier Steel? I'd say that a piece of it was being young and naive, thinking that I could do it all. I learned with time that that wasn't necessarily true, that there was a, a lot more I, I could have and should have been doing with Advance to further my business. But what actually led to Premier Steel was in 2014, I thought of this idea. Um, started in 2010, which was a recession. Everything, a lot of people had lost their jobs. A lot of people had lost even more than jobs. And I was always worried of what's going to happen at the next recession. And so at the next recession, and was I going to sit and wait for the next recession and then go, oh, what do we do now? Or was I going to do something that set us apart as a business that protected everyone's job and that still allowed everyone that had committed to be part of our business to still have a job? And so it was a little extreme because in 2014, people were celebrate, celebrating, you know, being finally being out of a recession, making money again. And people were buying their, their home, their second home, their boats. And I was worried about the next recession. And every, a lot of friends of mine from the same age group were, were, I would say, I don't want to say critical, but were questioning why was I so serious? That was always a, the kind of the comment, why was I so serious? I decided that if I could open up a business that was complementary to what we already did, that was actually affecting our current production, and I could do it better than what is currently being done, specifically on our what's called our combo projects, that it would give us a unique advantage to any other rough carpentry in our area. I didn't have to do it. As a business, we were doing well. I was doing well. And I took on Premier Steel knowing nothing about structural steel. Absolutely. And it was so you painful. So want, you want to diversify. Absolutely. Was, did you see, uh, was there a demand for miscellaneous steel? So for me, it wasn't so much that there was a demand because there was plenty of structural steel companies, miscellaneous steel companies, but there wasn't a steel company that was coordinating early end with our rough carpentry companies to ensure that the steel was coming out coordinated, that it was, um, it was almost, it, they were working in two different areas not speaking to each other because there was no relation and a general contractor is trying, while they like these companies to coordinate, isn't driving coordination. Right. And so we offer the service where we coordinate ourselves. We help the general contractors by coordinating ourselves and that reduces the need on the contracting side to push us as the framer or steel company, we're doing it ourselves. So. We offering the unique service of having both in house rather than two separate subcontractors was what led me to go. I, I want to do it, and I want to do it to do it to the degree and level that makes it easier and gives us an advantage. That's the maestro in you, man. So that's super super exciting. What's next for you? Have you thought about it? Yeah, I I have. And I would say that my next focus is, is almost counterintuitive. Whereas when I was young, I wanted to conquer everything and I thought I could add more subcontracting businesses. Do I think I'll add more someday? The answer is yes, I do. But my focus for is right now on get being better. I don't necessarily focus on how much more we're gonna grow, uh, whether it's 250 employees, 300 employees. I want to run a better business. Our business to offer careers to the people that are in our business today, that's not just a job, that's a career, that they follow the values that we as a business have left that come from my father, and ultimately run a better business and just be happy doing it. And with time, that's going to lead to the further opportunities, whether that's adding a different trade uh, or expanding our area to outside of Southern California. That will come with time. Yeah. No, I'm super proud of you, man. Super exciting. Thanks for being on today. Armando. Thank you. Always thank fun you. talking no, with you. No, thank you. So thanks, everybody, for joining the latest episode of Maestro Minute. I hope you guys enjoyed the video today, uh, the interview with Armando. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like, and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Maestro Minute podcast. Make sure to rate this podcast if you found it helpful, share it with a friend that could use it, and follow us on all major podcast platforms. The Maestro Minute, powered by Maestro Development.